Some say I don't need a microphone. For those at home, probably like to hear me. This morning we're going to start a new series on kingdom concepts and, and look at um, some things that, that Jesus taught us before he left. So the month of November we're going to look at that. And this morning's sermon is titled The Pursuit of Happiness. The Pursuit of Happiness. How many think that happiness is an attribute that most Americans would strive to achieve in their life? We would also agree that happiness may be lacking in our society today. Just with everything going on in our world and everything going on in people's lives. As a pastor, sometimes it's overwhelming because the phone's just ringing off the hook of families in crisis and in desperation to say, Pastor, I need you to pray. A young man called me this week and just sobbing his eyes out because his cousin decided to end his life this week. There's despair in America. And America's reaching for happiness but not knowing how to get it. How many know the kingdom of God is almost polar opposite the kingdom of this world? And the things that the world says will bring you happiness how many know are counterfeit and won't get there? And so we'd like to look at that this morning. The kingdom of this world says happiness is he who dies with the most toys. You just need another pair of shoes to make you happy. You just need another motorcycle. You just need another set of golf clubs. Right? I'm feeling depressed. Time to go shopping. Isn't that the truth? But does stuff make you happy? Not really. Don't get me wrong. It's nice to go shopping. Send me to Home Depot or Best Buy. This boy's the happy man. I'm sure I can find something on the shelf that has my name on it. But our world says you're just depressed or you're looking for happiness just by stuff. God's kingdom says something different. The kingdom of earth says you can find happiness in people. I learned that was not true with my first marriage. You see, I read the scripture that said the two will become one flesh. And so I had this hole in my heart that I thought if I married my wife, then she would complete that hole. And therefore, I would be happy by virtually being married. And I made mistakes as a husband because my unhappiness then became her fault. It's your fault. You're supposed to make me happy. It's your fault. Because I'm doing my part, and so therefore, if I'm not happy, it's your fault because you're not doing your job as my spouse. And do you see how we can put our contingency of happiness in other people? And how many know people will always fail us? I don't care how much love, I don't care what bond is, we are all human beings, and God never intended for us to make the world happy. There's not. You could be Pope, you could be Mother Teresa, and still not bring happiness to the world. Because earthly principles are not the same as kingdom principles. And so that's why we're going to do this study in kingdom principles. But the fact of the matter is the Christian community has gotten engrossed in our culture. How many know what I'm talking about? And we've accepted our culture as true, which is why you see more people in the church depressed today than ever before. You see more people in the church that can't find happiness because they've adapted these world models instead of kingdom principles. People keep telling Pastor that Bible you read is so updated. And I just laugh. Because it's so relevant for today. If people fully understood the Word of God, they would see it as every answer you will ever need. But we've gotten away from reading our Bibles. 
So we're going to look at kingdom principles of the pursuit of happiness. If you brought your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. And we're, some of you may recognize this passage of scripture as the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, good. Sunday school's paying off, right? And the Sermon on the Mount, all, all these phrases start with what? What word? Blessed, right? Most translations start with the word blessed. So the word blessed there comes from the um, Greek word makarios, which means happiness properly when God extends his benefits, receiving God's favor. How many think that's a different definition of happiness? Marcaeus, happiness is properly when God extends his benefits, receiving God's favor. How many see the word I or you anywhere in that sentence? How many see the word stuff anywhere in that sentence? Anybody see the word people anywhere in that sentence? What word do you see twice on that screen? God. Therefore, happiness can only come with you having a relationship with God. As a pastor, I get it all my own. You never find true happiness. You may pep yourself up with your money thinking, look what I have accomplished for myself, but guess what? It will always lead you away. If you doubt me, look at Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson had any shortage of money? In fact, he built another land. Isn't that your paradise, right? Like, wouldn't that be your paradise home? You've got a home with roller coaster rides and water fountains and anything you could possibly dream your house would have. You had swimming pools and the white picket fence and anything you would imagine. How can you not be happy, Pastor? I'm living in a shoebox if I only have a house with one more bathroom, I'll be happy. Misty says amen to that one. <laughs> Seven people with one bathroom. Oh, Especially on Sunday mornings. But how many of one more bathroom is still not going to make us happy? Because happiness cannot come from stuff. It cannot come from people. It cannot come from beliefs. It can only come when God extends his favor. So blessed means God's favor on your life. So we're going to look at what kingdom principles this morning that God attributes to us, starting with verse 1. And we're going to go one by one. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to look at some of these words, because some of these words in our English language are not translated correctly. When you hear the word poor, what do you think of? Money, okay? And when you hear poor in spirit, what do you think of? Okay, depressed, discouraged. Does anyone here think God wants us to celebrate being depressed and discouraged? Blessed are the depressed. Does that sound like a kingdom principle? No. So again, if you look up there, that's why it's so important when we read the scriptures that we really fully understand what it's saying, which is why I frequently will put the Greek or the Hebrew up there for you so you can see the, the, the word there in Aramaic means humility and living simply. I forget who coined the phrase, let us live simply so others might simply live. But it's a statement that we need to get in. But you see how contrary this is to the world's kingdom? The world's kingdom says, he who has the most stuff wins. God's kingdom says, he who lives simply has my favor. And the enemy wants us to be unhappy so we get distracted off of, of our relationship with him. That's his primary motivation in life, is distraction. Point number one in your notes is I receive God's favor. 
when I put building his kingdom above my own. I receive God's favor when I put building his kingdom above building my own. Isn't this contrary though to what we're taught? Oh pastor, once I get my home life in order, then I'll help the church. Once, Pastor, I get my finances in order, then I'll help the church. Well, scripture says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And I see most Christians today just scrambling to get their life in order so that they can then be a part of God's kingdom. And that's just not scriptural. God wants us to invest in kingdom. And how many know sometimes the stuff in our life can distract us and get in the way? This and I've been having this conversation at home. Like, how many know doing household chores can just fill up your schedule? If you doubt that, come to our house. Doing laundry for seven people is a full time job, doing dishes for seven people is a full time job, cleaning up after messes is a full time job. So it's very easy for the mother of five children to be consumed with spending their entire life just living and existing and not being able to have time for oneself. Not being able to have time to get along with God and not having time to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because you're spending and consuming your entire life just existing. I had to do a journal this week and just chart your schedule. What percentage of your life is just existing? Getting up, feeding yourself, going to work, coming, doing chores, um, just existing. We have all this technology in America, and yet how many think our life's a little bit more complicated today than when we had all this stuff, right? Back in the day, they'd wake up before the crack of dawn and they had to make breakfast from scratch and, and labor, but have we really changed that much? We're still spending our, spinning our wheels just existing. And I hear the Father saying, look at your life and how can you simplify your life? You create more margin in your life. You create more space that I can speak to you. You create more space that you can invest in the kingdom of God. We know there's no laundry in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> we know there's no dishes in heaven. All the stuff that we consume our life with is not in heaven. No, I'm not saying we shouldn't do laundry. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do dishes. But we need to look at our life to say, what can we do to simplify it so at the end of the day, I can sit on the couch for five minutes and take a deep breath. Not climb in bed to say, I'm exhausted. I, I've said this before. I don't know how single parents do it. I was a single parent for a couple of years, and it's exhausting. But single parents deserve an opportunity to just take a deep breath of fresh air. We're so consumed by everything society says we need to have. We need to have a perfect house. We need to have the perfect car. And we need to have all this stuff to make our kids happy. Can I tell your parents something? Your kids will not remember when you got them on their fifth birthday. Your kids will not remember when you got them this Christmas, a year or two or five years from now. But guess what they will remember? You going outside and playing with them and the, and the leaves. Building relationships is all part of the kingdom of God. And I hear the Father saying, in this season, let's focus on relationships. How can we, in this COVID season, be relational? How can we call people, or email, or text, or send letters, or cards, and just let people know, I'm thinking about you, I love you, I'm caring about you. Can we go and sit on the front lawn and wave to them from a distance to say, how can I pray for you today? 
And if that means putting our fine china away and getting paper plates so that we don't have to do dishes, then that's what we need to do. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What you do on this earth impacts eternity. But we're so consumed with getting stuff that we forget that our neighbors are going to hell if they die today. That should grieve us. That should say, I'm going to clear my schedule so that I can introduce one more person this month to Jesus. How many here had a job in sales? Anybody? Sales people here sometime in your lifetime? You know at the end of the month, right, you have the quotas. It was that final week of the month, right? You just have this kick, you have this push. I'm going to sell one more car, or I'm going to sell one more insurance policy. It kind of motivated you to push through. What goals do we have for discipleship as a church? What's motivating us to say, I'm going to spend five more minutes in the grocery store so I can talk to that cashier? Because it seems like every time I'm going to Kroger's, same cashier is there. I just see her countenance just doesn't seem like she needs happiness. So I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time and make sure I go down her lane just to talk to her to say, uh, Cheryl, I see that you're here every time. Is there anything I can pray for you? Is Cheryl being in heaven is more important than me getting all my dishes done at home. So church, bless are those who live simple, but theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's move on. Number two, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Again, does that mean we're supposed to cry all day? Be depressed, discouraged? God loves it when we're sad and we cry all day, right? Is that what that scripture means? Okay. Again, can you see how the world might be confused when they read that? And they say, I'm not serving that kind of God. He wants us to be depressed, discouraged, and cry all day long. Doesn't sound like a happy thing to me. But when we look at that word born, the translation there is showing compassion, sympathetic pity for those suffer the suffering of others. Showing compassion. Sympathetic pity for the sufferings of others. How many think our world needs a little dose of compassion? I don't see it today. I see a very judgmental society. I'm broke. Well, what did you spend your money on? Uh, I'm tired. Oh, what are you, were you partying all night? We're so quick to judge why someone is deficient in a certain area instead of reaching out in compassion to say, God's blessed me with this, so I'm in turn going to give it to someone who's in need. But I don't see this in the world. We build our little silos, and as long as our silo is Disneyland, I don't care what's out of Disneyland. You know what I'm talking about? How are we Take care of your own little world and don't worry about it. And most people have no clue who their neighbors are. Our misty and nice neighbors invited us over for a bonfire last night. It was fantastic. We had such a good time. Dogs played together. The kids played together. And we just had a great time bonding. And we really got to know them at a deeper level. That's what the kingdom of God is just spending time with people outside of our circle and being compassionate when we see someone in need. We see this all through scripture. When Peter walked by the man who was healing and begging for alms, he said, silver and gold, not I not, but what I have, I give you. God is not asking you to give something you don't have. He's asking us to show compassion, and if someone has a need, and we have what they need, we know God's calling us to meet that need. But what's typically a response? Not my problem. No, someone else will meet that need. You know what's so cool about the early church? Is 
that said, everyone brought what they had and no one was in it for me. Can you imagine that for Hamilton? Can you imagine a Hamilton where no one is homeless? Can you imagine a Hamilton where everyone has to be square meals a day? Can you imagine a Hamilton where you don't have to beg for volunteers that you say, here's a need and the whole community comes through? Well, it sounds like the food distribution pastor. It is. The community recognized that there's a need for food. And teachers got asked their bosses to leave school early to come unload a truck and hand out food because they knew that this was a need in our community. And those of you that worked it saw the beautifulness of the whole community coming together to serve the community. Was it a lot of work? You betcha. Anybody that unloaded those trucks knew you were on ibuprofen and heat pads the next day. But if it meant one more person was able to eat a meal and had one more day to be connected with the Father before they passed away, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. Because guess what? My pain went away. My weariness went away. But it's being compassionate to say, this person does not have food. And Missy and I had our children here all three weeks to serve because we wanted them to see what it's like to not have it. Maybe your children never did this to you, but occasionally our children complain about what's for dinner. I know, your, your house is different. You put it on and they said, thank you, Mom, for dinner. Oh, it's so kind of you to make me broccoli for dinner. Right? That was your also like it. But you know when it changed their attitudes real quickly? To see a car pull up with a little boy or a little girl. You could see they didn't have breakfast or probably lunch. And they didn't even get the box in the car. They were opening up to take an apple out. And I asked one little girl, when's the last time you ate? And she stopped and she could not answer my question. Blessed are those who show compassion to a world who is lost church. For theirs, they will be gone. How will the world be comforted, church, unless we show them compassion? Not my problem. Somebody else's. Who then? Whose problem is it? Moving on. Oh, did I do that point? So I receive God's favor when I tend to the needs of others. We have this mentality, if I tend to the needs of others, then that means my needs are not being met, right? Isn't that the logic that the world says? But here's the key, if everyone is serving everyone else, it's like a pop-up or a carry-in. Now, granted, when you have a carry-in, you're going to go try your own food, but how would like trying other people's food? Right? Because you're like, woohoo, can I get the recipe of that? Does anybody get hungry in a carry-in? You're all laughing. Why? Because usually we have to roll out of here because we're so full of trying everyone else's food. And that's what serving does. When every person in the kingdom of God is serving, you should be so full that you have to get a wheelchair to where you got it. Only reason the Church of America is so deficient is because we fail to say, I don't have green beans, but I have a can of corn. I don't have money to give to the church, but I can sit in a chair and pray for cars as they come by. We show compassion to others. We receive the favor of God. Let's move on. Blessed are the meek, the label here in the earth. How do you think the word meek is a positive word in our American culture? 
If we translate meek as what? Switch the M to a W when you get it. Right? Is that about right? We translate meekness into weakness. But let's look what the scripture says meekness is. Meekness is praise to submit, be gentle. Let's look at this one. Demonstrating power without undue harshness. How many think that's contrary, right? We think meekness is the absence of power. But when you have someone that has a gentle spirit, there's power behind them. Perfect example is Pastor Christie. She has such a gentle spirit about her, but she carries such power in her little vessel. Same with Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was probably the most one of the most meek people you ever did, but you know what she commanded. Respect through her weakness. But our society has a problem with this. We have a problem submitting to anybody. Can I tell you that even Jesus submitted to his Father? He said, Lord, I know I'm about to be crucified, so hey, God, if you could change your plan, take me off the cross, that'd be fantastic. Submission is not a negative thing, church. There's power in submission. When we submit to the authority in our life, there's blessings. I think we struggle with that, right? As kids, we struggle with the submission of our parents. And you, maybe you're the perfect child right now. You just, everything your parents said, you said, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and you did it right away. I get it. But some of us weren't that way. Some of us had to wait until we got into adulthood to learn the lesson of submission. You know how God does that? He sends us a boss that we really don't like. And we're like, are you kidding me? Lord, I'm willing to submit to this boss, but not this one, because this one's a pain in the butt. But how many know God can give us the pains and butts to teach us the, the meekness of serving, serving them? God doesn't ask us to submit to only those that we get along with. Every human being has someone in our life that God's called us to submit to. Misty submits to me even when she doesn't like it. She loves me to pieces, but there's days that she disagrees with me 100%. disagrees, guess what she does? Lord, he's my husband. I'm going to submit to him. So I pray right now that you would change his heart and you would speak to him. And guess what? This guy whoops my butt. This is how you wrong. Oh, the art of submission says I'm going to pray for someone who I don't agree with. I'm going to pray for that person because I'm going to respect what they're saying even though it's wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for them that God will speak to them because it's not my job to speak to them because I'm under their submission. But I'm going to pray, Lord, I know this person has a good heart, but right now I think they're missing the heart. So can you speak to them and change their heart? And if they're right and I'm wrong, then change my heart. Can you imagine what our world would be like where we pray and submit to our president, we pray and submit to our governor, we pray and submit to our cops and, and court officials. I'll tell you what, Misty Knight did not like the judge we had. She was cruel and evil. We submitted to her authority, though. We prayed, oh, what? I God would change her heart. But in the end, we were respectful of her, and we were respectful of her decision, even though we didn't like it. And we petitioned a higher court because of it. Submission so doesn't mean, church, that we're going to agree. Everything that human beings say is not. But we've lacked submission in America. We've replaced submission with rebellion. And we wonder why we're not happy inside. 
It's because we've raised a generation that's rebellious, that says, if I don't like what authority says, tell them no and don't listen. We've raised kids to say, if you don't like what your parents have, just do a temper tantrum and your parents will give in to you. How's that working for us? Anybody see a few of those kids on the street? Anybody see a few of those kids in the grocery store? Anybody see them as adults today? Any questions? Because we fail at the church to teach them the commandment of submission. We've created an entitled society that says it's all about me and my way and what I want. Well, guess what, Frank Sinatra? You're wrong. It's God's way, not your way. And as church, it's our job to raise our young people to say, you need to submit to God no matter what he asks you to do. And guess what? Frequently, God will ask you to do something you don't want to do. Pastors included. But I'm thankful for a wife that prays for me when I'm wrong. And will submit to me even when I'm wrong. Thankful for a woman that's patient with me. And prays for me every day. She makes me a better person because of her being spared. And blessed are the meat for they will inherit what? Kingdom of heaven, right? What does that say? You inherit what? You see that? When we submit, even when the other person is wrong, God blesses us here on this earth. Poor concept, isn't it? We think we have to fight for what we want. We have to think we have to tell the boss you're wrong. The thing about an authority is you all are kind of right. If your boss makes a mistake, if you make a mistake because your boss told you to do something, guess who's not responsible? Your boss. And God had to show me that. The pain in the butt bosses that I worked for, if I would just submit to them, they were removed before I left. Within a year or two, they were gone because they were exposed that they didn't know what they were doing. That was the first lesson I had to learn. I think I've shared this story before. My first day as an intern, guess what I had to do? Clean toilets. I said, are you kidding me? I'm here to learn how to preach. I'm here to learn how to pray. I'm here how to bring healing to the world. I'm an intern. What if the janitor can clean toilets? But I had to learn how to submit to that pastor who was teaching me the most valuable lesson and that's how I have a meek spirit. He said, Patrick, until you learn to serve, you never learn to lead. And I thank you to this day for that lesson. Because scrubbing those toilets taught me a valuable lesson on how to be an effective pastor. So, point number three I receive God's favor. When I submit to the authority that God has placed in my life. Let me to have a like a person. And when we submit, even when that person is wrong, we receive the blessings. But guess what happens when we don't submit to the authority when they're wrong? We step out from that blessings of God. We rob ourselves. Because when we don't submit, what's the option? What's the opposite of submission? Is it any wonder why America is so messed up right now? Because we've not taught submission and what we've taught is rebellion. Rebellion doesn't just affect you. We see that the riots that are going on in our country, we see that in the chaos in our country. It is time the church rises up to say, I'm sorry. God doesn't say submit to a leader when you like them or dislike them. 
Moving on. Last are the verse those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Righteousness is the approval of God. What does the world say? You need the approval of man. You see that? I spent my entire childhood trying to win the approval of my father. Did it bring me happiness? I never got it. I thought if I just did something more, I could win his approval. I tried every sport out there. Went out for football, went out for soccer, went out for track. This boy's not a jock, I'm sorry. In hockey, and that was the only sport that I was okay at. I loved hockey, they called me Gumby because I was very flexible on the ice. Not so much today. Misty and I went to kids walking, and it was like, oh, dear Jesus, help me. This boy not Gumby anymore. Gumby can hard it up. Church, we've lost the art of hunger and thirsty for righteousness. We've tolerated sin, church. We've tolerated just doing the bare minimum. I'm going to show up to church on Sunday and say hello and a few prayers and amens, and that's good enough for me. But point number four is I receive God's favor when I obey Him partially. I receive God's favor when I obey Him occasionally. Is that what it says? I receive God's favor when I obey Him completely. It's hard. Not easy. Obedience stinks sometimes. I'm just telling you. I have to apologize to my wife and kids frequently. Daddy screwed up today. You said words I shouldn't have said. I used my anger to discipline you. I'm sorry. I wasn't sensitive to your needs today. I'm sorry. But it's time that we see God's favor by obeying Him. Completely. Moving on. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We looked at this a little bit earlier. Mercy is what? Compassion. Acting occasionally with the, what is this? Acting consistently with the revelation of God's covenant. That's what mercy means. The reason the world has a problem with Christianity is because we're fake eating. Our young people hate phoniness. And if you would just be translate, transparent with them and say, guess what, young people? We're going to fail you, and we're going to make mistakes every day. But it's not about not making mistakes. It's about growth. Be a real man and acknowledge when you make a mistake. That's the biggest lesson I can teach my boys as a father. It's only what they do. Say, I'm sorry. Yes, I did that. But what do we do? Well, Micah did. Micah did. Oh, what you do? I see the Church of America doesn't care about the covenant of God. Is it any wonder why sickness is prevalent in our society today? Is it any wonder why there's despair? Is there any wonder why the Church of America is not growing today? Because the Church of America is not in right covenant with God. And if we would just repent and say, God, I'm sorry. If we would just say, it is so important to be God that I am in right covenant with you. I'm going to be consistent with my faith. Not nah, okay, I'm going to go back to church. Okay, got what they want. Okay, they don't need me for a few months. Oh, life crisis. Oh, let me go back to church. Oh, they don't need me. We're yo-yos, aren't we? Why is it 
be able to talk to God while we're going through a crisis? I can tell you what, this election cycle, I've never seen the church more united than ever before. There have been more prayer rallies across this country than ever before. Because the Church of America has finally awoken to say, I've been sleeping for too long. And it's time to put righteousness back in America today. Matthew chapter 25, start at 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? And when did we feed you or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And he will say to those on his side, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and the angels. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick, and you were in prison, and you did not look after me. They also answered, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothing, or sick, or in prison, and did not? You will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, the righteous to eternal life. Point number four. I receive God's favor when I am a good steward of what he's placed in my care. I receive God's favor when good steward of what he's placed in my care. God's blessed our America with so much, but it's now for building up our own kingdom's church. It's for building his kingdom. It breaks my heart to see the church of America be selfish. Poverty should not exist in America. There shouldn't be. We have more money than the world the rest of the, most of the third world countries combined. And I think America just needs to take a missions trip to a third world country. Because if they went to the Philippines and saw people living in trees, it might change their perspective. When they see people walking 12 hours one way just to go to church, it might change their perspective. We are so spoiled as Americans to think everything God has given me is for me. So not true. He's blessed you so that you can invest in his kingdom. What's in your toolbox? It's not all the same. Let me know everybody's toolbox is different. Mine may have a hammer, yours may have a screwdriver. God did that on purpose. So that I can come over to your house and use my hammer, and you can come over to my house and use your screwdriver. But instead, we have people walking around hitting each other in the head with hammers and bonking each other's screwdrivers. With my hammer, you can't use it. Who's 
flesh, God gave it to you for you to use for his kingdom, not mine. Moving on. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pastor, I want to see God. I want to hear God. No, this shows you the way. That's why Jesus said, come to him as little children. Children are the most pure things on the face of the earth. Look at this little baby here. Can you get any more pure than that? The word pure means spiritually clean because purged and purified by God, free from sin. How many does that sound like the Church of America? Did anyone wonder why we don't have the happiness in the Church of America? And we're not willing to allow God to purge the sin out of our life. We get prideful, we get arrogant, we say, no, I'm not going to acknowledge that sin in my life. We're going to change the subject. But you see with kids, right? You start dealing with an issue, they're dealing with what they do. And you know you've hit on something when they have a temper tantrum. You know you hit on something when they when they get pride for it. No, I'm not going to deal with it. Well, he can eat first. Mm -hmm. Why do we know better as adults? We justify our sin. Why don't you come to church? Well, I just want to sleep in on Sunday. I work hard six days a week, so I'm going to sleep in on Sunday. Well, I'm going to sleep in on Sunday because pastor. Volunteered at the church all week, so I punched my card and I've done my due diligence, so you don't need me on Sunday. Isn't it amazing how we can spiritualize sin? We're really good at it, aren't we? But how many of God's not impressed with us spiritualizing sin? It's time that we say, God. I'm going to deal with those issues that you're dealing with in my mind. And I get stoned as a pastor all the time. Because the part of my job people don't like is when I confront areas of sin. You can't do that, pastor. You need to love me. Oh, I love you. Don't get me wrong. I love my children even when they're sinning. But it's still my job as a parent to correct them when they're wrong. And likewise, as a pastor, it's my job to pull someone privately and say, That's telling me you need to work on this. And there's some that say, Thank you for bringing that so much attention. I'm ready to really struggle with Can you pray with me that I can overcome this? And there's others that just say, I don't want you to You're hearing wrong from God. Okay? Not my job to. to your reaction is your reaction, and this is what I'm hearing from God. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'm just told to tell you about it. The church, I receive God's favor when I stand in the right covenant. How many want to be blessed of God? How many want to be so full of God that it exudes for every poor? How many can tell when someone's in the right covenant? You can tell Pastor Christie is a right of the time. She exudes joy wherever she walks. Doesn't matter if she's changing into kid's diaper or not. Jesus just oozes from every poor body. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. I mean, you can't fake happiness. How are you? Oh, bless! I am great! You'll hear me say this all the time. Try again. What do you mean? What do you mean? If you fix her whole that smile up. I know you're struggling with something, so what are you struggling with? Bless are the writers, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does it say? Isn't that different from our society? Thank you. 
respect the authority. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be children of God. Do you see that? That last passage we talk about separating the sheep and the goats. What scares me is people think that they're going to go into heaven and God's going to say, Depart from me for your never new. We know you can say the sinner's prayer and not make it to heaven. You're looking at me, what? Not about mouth and words. When we surrender, say the Lord's Prayer, it's saying, Lord, I'm surrendering my entire life to you, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to crucify my ways and follow you. Back in the 80s and 90s, what was our cultural thing? WWGD. It was the cool thing of what Jesus did. And I think we need to wrestle around that. If Jesus was standing in the church of America, would he be proud of what he cried? Peacemakers are people who bravely declare God's terms which make someone. I receive God's favor when I help others reconcile In the church, it is time that we welcome the prodigal children home. And you watch, mark my words. Some of you sitting here had children that once attended this church and no longer do. Don't be shocked. You didn't know what you were talking about when you warned them that it was important to serve God. They kind of ran off. And you've been praying for them ever since, and your heart has been crushed. And maybe you've stubborn and been thinking a while, but guess what? It's time for our prodigal children. Last but not least, blessed are those who are persecuted. desire of overtaking. Nowhere in scripture does it say becoming a Christian is a bad process. If you want a happy, peaceful job, ministry is not for you. People say, how's your easiest job? I would love your job. You sit in your office and pray all day and worship and sing hymns and praise choruses and just become a monk, I would, I'm so jealous. I say, what are you smoking? That's not my job. I receive God's favor when I'm facing opposition for doing the will of the Lord. Can I tell you something? The enemy will not interfere with your life you're not with right I'll say that again. The enemy will not interfere with your life if you're not with right If you've gone seasons and seasons with nothing, no obstacles in your life, it might cause you to pause to say, have you backslidden? And are you actively pursuing? The enemy will only interfere with those 